Town, on the southern tip of Africa. South Africa's mother city. With three and a half million residents, it's not the largest in Africa, but nowhere is there greater diversity. Past and present, landscape, history, and cultures. Cape Town is a city of contrasts. New administrative centers, alongside places where slaves were traded less than 200 years ago. Cape Town is special because it's really in the imaginary of South Africa. It's the first urban conurbation um, in, 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 in the period of colonial contact. And so really it was the prototype for urbanism in South Africa. I love the fact that somehow our people are able to recognize the beauty of where they are and they can articulate what that beauty is. Here in Table Bay is where Europeans arrived in 1652 to found a way station and supply point for the Dutch East India Company. The Castle of Good Hope became the symbol of Dutch rule for 150 years. Today it's a tourist attraction right next to the city's administrative district and all the contemporary problems. It's a tough city. It's windswept. It's got uh, these sandy landscapes. Uh, it is harsh in a way. And so you kind of find that again reflected in the culture. So people, uh, um, for a whole lot of different reasons, uh, um, in, in particularly the poorer parts of the city, it's actually very violent. Everyday life is really marked by quite acute uh, uh, domestic violence and violence associated with, with drug cultures and gang cultures and so on. And so there's, it's, it's kind of a city that is caught up in this fundamental paradox. It's really beautiful. The people are really amazing, very welcoming, very warm, very funny. But at the same time, it's also a city that has always got a shadow. 20 years after the end of apartheid, Cape Town still bears the scars. Officially, black and white South Africans have the same rights and can live in the same districts. But they're still separated. Now the divide is between rich and poor. Here in Lavender Hill, there's 75% unemployment. The crime rate is high. Shootings are commonplace. Well, it's changed my life dramatically. After being a fireman for 14 years and uh, being introduced to crack cocaine in less than a year, I'd lost my job. I'd lost my house, I'd lost basically everything. And then I had to move back to the townships. And uh, one day uh, I visited the soup kitchen because I was hungry. And uh, some women, they spoke some hope into my life, telling me, OK, you can change your life. Which, with their help and their support, I changed my life. Paul Talyard is looking for projects. He wants to repair derelict buildings and create workspaces in them. When the old factory is restored to its former glory, it will proclaim the message that individuals can change things themselves. So far, he has persuaded 50 young men from the district to join him. His conditions, no drugs and no violence. In return, he offers a structure for their lives and looks for projects that can create jobs. I'm an ex-gangster, drug addict. I was on the street for, say, 10, 11 years. But since joining the organization, my family took me back. And I'm happy in the environment that I'm now in and the people in the community uh, accepting me again, like the way I am, because uh, when I was a gangster, we used to rob the people and stuff. 
But since I've seen that people who gave me, and I'm quite happy where I am now. And you see, I'm smoking a lot. I'm working on a on a labor scale of building in industrial. So you know, it, when you go to work, you must smoke. That was in our blood. If you must work, you hey, was work a pipe man, who's jayran, who's jayran? Nah, it's all right, man. You know, when I come in here with him, then I see, nah, it's, it's lovely, yeah, man. Yeah, I suppose you've been transferred to move, guys. Drugs, robbery, assault, violence. Sometimes murder. Those are the usual biographies. Whole families and the atmosphere of a district depend on an individual's fate. Paul has won over whole gangs. I found that if I change the mindset of the man, it affects the rest of the family. Because if the man's not working and he's not a role model for his children, then the whole family goes down. And if the whole family goes down, the whole community goes down with it. So if I can focus, if I can change and transform the mindset of the man, yeah, if I can transform the way he thinks of himself, the way he thinks of work, you know, transform his attitude towards work, uh, towards social responsibility, towards self-responsibility, and then sort of uh, uh, change their mindset. Let them see what they can do and what they're capable of. I'm halfway there. A few streets away, Paul has repaired a building with his project, Hands of Honor. The garden has created jobs. The vegetables are sold. But above all, the garden is a demonstration of how produce can be grown in sandy soil. This know-how is communicated via the ex-gangsters to the whole neighborhood. The building houses a clothing factory. School uniforms are sewn here. It provides the women with a modest income. And the uniforms are much cheaper because they're made in the township for the township children. Before the clothing factory, school uniforms were an unattainable luxury for most children here. These small initiatives in the townships are especially valuable because there's hardly any large industry here. I think that one of the biggest things that I haven't mentioned also, which links to that, that sense of pride, is the fact that there aren't many jobs. So if we can create a vibrant uh, community, that gives people a sense of jobs where they can create livelihoods for themselves so that they're not dependent on the government to give them handouts, that they can actually create living for themselves would be what we're looking at in terms of the ne next 10 years. The rich come to Cape Town. No one gets rich here, they say. The city's coastal location and its climate make Cape Town attractive for South African as well as foreign tourists. The beaches are only a few kilometers away from the townships. Instead of AIDS, crime and unemployment, the only problem here seems to be the sharks. The sciences, electronics and the textile industry are at home in Cape Town. The contrasts are everywhere in large structures and in small projects. If these projects are the lovely idea of one individual that has got a lot of passion and vision and is very articulate about what it's meant to do, that's great. Um, if they have done that against all odds, that's another up, clearly. Uh, just the level of resourcefulness in all of these projects was absolutely inspiring because many of them literally came from nothing. Um, to, to this point of visibility. Um, and then that point of connection with the community where you can see that it's not just an outward giving, but there's been a response from the community that has said, yes, you've seen our need, or yes, you have answered to it, or you've come up with a way we couldn't even see as a way to be more alive in this space, to have a greater sense of pride in this place, to feel a sense of ownership and safety. Chapman's Peak Drive is one of the most spectacular roads in the world. And lots of car advertisements end in Hout Bay. The nearby township was a no-go area just a few years ago. A new recycling station is located at the township entrance. The township residents bring their rubbish here every Saturday, their own 
and also garbage they've collected. The materials are sorted and then sold to industry for recycling. This would have been unimaginable just a short time ago. I would like to reach that goal that everybody understands that everything that is waste can be reusable, can be, uh, can, can, and it also can, can stop being like, uh, we are living in a mud in, in, in IY. Because when it is raining, every glass bottles are running around the road, uh, injuring our children. The plastic stops the water, the water became smelly, the pollution. So I, I, I think I, I must be there. I must be the one. Local recycling can only work if the community supports and lives it. Here, three students from the University of Cape Town are trying out something unusual. They ensure that the waste is sold to big recyclers at the highest price. And they distribute vouchers to everyone who brings their rubbish here. There's a competition for the best collector of the week, calculated by weight. They evolved the idea in their apartment. No, 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 it's by the harbour. It's by the harbour. The key is um, to move forward in a sustainable manner. And that's people in the past have been so close-minded, they start up businesses and they're just, you know, thinking about the bottom line. But um, I, I feel that the newer generation, we're thinking more, you know, how can we sustain our earth and our communities, have a social environmental impact while sustaining your own livelihood? And um, we identified a problem in this community. Um, waste is an issue. And uh, we, we feel we found a solution for that, you know? And uh, so everyone can benefit. The volumes are tallied once a week. The vouchers are worth hard cash. Most of the collectors are kids from the neighborhood. The vouchers can be exchanged in small shops along the township's main street. Fish and chips is the most popular. But a laundry, a hairdresser's and a small supermarket also participate. There are now 500 collectors. This not only means that Hout Bay is getting cleaner, jobs and public spaces are being created. Living conditions in the township are improving in a number of ways. The three students who started the project have ambitious plans. The key thing is here, we're trying to make a replicable model. So we can replicate this anywhere in South Africa. We can identify a community that needs uh, waste collections or recycling to be done. And then if we set up a depot there, we can set up in a Pindo Pindo, where we do the incentivized recycling. And then we can work with the local vendors and also do work there in um, stimulating their trade. We can also do waste collections there and generate profits there to help service that. And then just keep replicating that from community to community. So by the end of this year, we, we want to have developed basically a, a franchise model. Hout Bay could see the first franchise system for the upgrading of townships. Cape Town's biggest townships are located in barren, sandy areas. The wind is always blowing through the gaps that still separate the townships today. The residents have resigned themselves to the fact that only a few bushes survive here, and in summer, nearly all the vegetation is burnt by the sun. There's an exception in Mitchell's Plain. Right behind the local primary school, a green oasis. A school garden with vegetables and mushroom cultivation. Under the guidance of a neighborhood association, the children learn about nature, about healthy nutrition, and what can be grown in the sandy soil. The municipality provided the land. It's a very good job, it's very uh, personally fulfilling, but also to help our community that has been struggling all the years. Uh, I find that, uh, that we, uh, the community as a whole will now get an opportunity to, to do their own foods. But we, 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 we teach the children, and children go home 
and they and they ask their parents to do uh, the, the garden. With the education they have, they can then teach their parents as well. The garden doesn't only serve the school. Today, the chief buyer of South Africa's largest supermarket chain is visiting. He wants to see the mushroom cultivation. It was also started by the community organization to produce healthy food and work opportunities within the possibilities of Mitchell's Plain. Things are looking good for the small association seed. The mushrooms from the cooling containers behind the school could soon be making their way into the gourmet departments of big supermarkets. The green oasis in Mitchell's Plain has an influence way beyond the boundaries of the schoolyard. I think the dream starts uh, with a place you live in. So it's at my home. And then right now I'm also, uh, through what I've known uh, and, and received from seed, I've now given plants out to neighbors that have actually commented how, how positive this has made them because I'm now sharing, sharing plants and I'm sharing, um, uh, 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 sharing what I'm growing with the neighbors. And, and I'm hoping that, it's, that it will actually have a knock-on effect and help uh, my, my immediate neighborhood. When school is out, the kids take their newly acquired knowledge home. Almost all of them have their own little garden. I think for me, the greatest solution could be when communities that have got the problems are able to articulate what the problem is so that the officials are not providing solutions that are not in resonance with what is happening on the ground. So the solution is when government and communities, and most importantly, the private sector is brought on board to try and find solutions that make sense, that take cognizance of the context, the culture, the languages that people, so it's a, it's a variety of things, but it's partnerships that could be solutions to this, to the problems that I think we face. Because you can't have a situation where you've got a problem with schools, but that doesn't link up to the problem that perhaps toileted schools are not functioning of that well. So it's about partnerships and making sure that there's a connectivity on all of these issues. On average, black Cape Tonians earn just one-tenth of what whites earn. Unemployment is 10 times higher. Many townships have neither electricity nor sanitation. Kayalicha, new home, is Cape Town's largest township and the site of an urban experiment. The municipality has cut a swathe right through the middle of the vast township, built playgrounds, and the first public illuminated path. This has made the local train station more accessible. Residents now venture onto the street at night, and it has given Kailicha a vibrant center. The city authorities view the main benefit as crime prevention, and initial results seem to confirm that. Buildings line the road like watchtowers, providing a feeling of security. Apartment blocks are not part of South Africa's indigenous culture. People here don't like to live above one another. But the new buildings are intended to show that it's possible, providing new opportunities for public space, parks and roads, bringing life to the townships. There are small public libraries all over Cape Town. With the help of volunteers, many of them provide much more than just books. They're safe places for kids, where they can learn more than they do at school. A painting group, philosophy club, dance group, computer group, and of course, a girls club. When there's a power failure, the music comes from a mobile phone. Well, um, we learn a lot. It's better than like walking around, you know what I mean, around the streets. We come here to learn. We do our homework so we don't get into trouble. We do research and then, yeah. 
Especially in the townships, education is the decisive factor in shaping one's future. And knowledge of English is vital. Many of the instructors used to study in the library when they themselves were kids. The library is uh, it's a big part of my life. I feel like when I come here, I feel at home. That's the actual place when you don't have friends here, you come here. You're going to find friends here. Sometimes, you know, like if you're watching TV, you're going to see the library is like silent, silent, silent. Yeah, if you come here, it's not silent at all. It's totally different. It's a place where you interact with people sometimes. It's a place where you do projects with people. You be reading together. We like having a lot of like great time because there's actually like projects happening here, like non-profit organizations coming in here. So you can do drama, you can do a lot of things. So yeah. But there are still parts of Cape Town that are ruled by gangs. Coloreds and blacks were driven out of the city during the apartheid era. And their living conditions have hardly improved since. Lavender Hill is one of the areas that even the police are afraid to enter. Anybody who crosses the gangs here is punished in public. The usual method is to hang a burning tire around their necks. The project Mothers Unite operates in the center of Lavender Hill. Its original aim was simply to provide a hot meal for their own children's school friends. Eventually, it was 30 and then it was 50. Then I moved out of my dining room. You know, I, I, had a, I have a stoop like this, also with the, with the roof. And I took um, the crates and uh, not this, these ones, other crates and uh, benches that I had and chairs that I had. And I just packed it nicely around on my stoop. It started with 20 bowls of soup. But the news spread so quickly that twice as many children came every day. So far, Carol Jacobs has never sent anyone away. I can't wait for church to do something. I can't wait for this one and that one to do. I'm going to do something. Although it's small, I'll just, I'll just do something about it. And that is how it started. Providing a hot meal is still the main purpose. But Mothers Unite has become much more. The docks donated a few containers. Each one offers a program for a different age group. Playing, handwork, first aid courses, or sewing. The children have become the most vulnerable now in the community because of poverty and because of where they are located. We have about, in the area, we have eight informal settlements. They want to show the kids that there are alternatives to the local gangs. Growing vegetables and trees teaches them what it means to take responsibility, be patient and care about their neighborhood. Children between the ages of 3 and 15 come here nearly every day after school. The elder ones help out, and Mothers Unite has become a home for many of them. One of our children, she's been with us now for, I think, probably the past two years now, and she had told her mother that her mother needs to come and see me. And the mother rocked up here on the Monday and she asked me what it is that I want from her. I said, I don't want anything. I don't even recall wanting to see you. She said, no. Her daughter told her that I want to see her because she needs to volunteer here at Mothers Unite. We were both confused, but she is up till this point, she's here a year and two months, the mother. So the child, when I looked at that, I thought, what an awesome moment. 
for the child to make that collection of I want my mother to be here. I want her to be where, where I'm happiest. You know, and that's one of our volunteers was here at Mothers Unite. More than 120 meals each day, made with donations. Supermarket leftovers are the only proper meal many of these children ever have. It's small projects like this that will help overcome the separation between white and black, rich and poor, safety and violence. Table Mountain towers above Cape Town. Much has changed in its shadow. Now there's optimism and a sense of change. The end of apartheid, the Football World Cup, the nomination for World Design Capital 2014. When many Cape Tonians came together, that's when they've been successful. This is the character of the people and the city. The devastating schism between those who have the responsibility within government or municipalities to do the work of recognizing what people are doing from the grassroots up. The fact that we as Cape Townians on the panel were surprised by some of the things that we saw, things we literally didn't know existed, um, meant that even more so in, in the face of our city council or municipality that really needs to recognize the extent of activism and proactiveness that's coming from the grassroots up and innovation especially because there's creative thinking that is not really being valued or visible to our government locally and the municipalities that should be making the difference. So my vision for the city is really that we can persuade the powerful of the city and the leaders in the city to pay serious attention to these prototypes, to put in the necessary investments to take them from prototypes to mainstream, so that we build models on how to run schools better, how to get communities involved in the running of their communities, and how to use the energy and the vibrancy and the enthusiasm of young people and children in the city as the key resource to, in a way, make Cape Town a truly creative and, and livable city. Cape Town was once South Africa's mother city. Today, it could be the greatest urban role model on the African continent. <laughs>